Lord um, Hindul Sen Gupta. I have invited Tenzing Damdul, a researcher on Tibetan issues, to join me in conversation today. Tenzing has a very interesting history. His family had to flee Tibet when uh, the Chinese took over and marched and captured that entire area. Uh, his family fled to India. He himself was born in Uti in Tamil Nadu and studied in India. He's a graduate of Jawaharlal Nehru University and now works with the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives, a think tank in Delhi specializing in Tibet affairs. I asked Tenzing to join me because we want to discuss one key thing, the Tibet bill that's causing so much news around the world, uh, which is now pending for presidential signature in America. It seems to be bringing the Tibetan issue back in the forefront in limelight around the world. There are many issues to discuss about the Tibet bill, but let me begin by welcoming Tenzing. Tashi the Lake, pleasure is all mine. Tenzing, let me then jump straight into the points that I want to discuss with you. I was looking over the Tibet bill, you know, and a lot of news has been created because the American legislators came and met His Holiness the Dalai Lama and so on and so forth, right? Now, my first question yeah. is, if you read the clauses of the Tibet bill, the so-called Tibet bill, which is waiting for presidential signature, one of the things that really struck me immediately was that America has makes makes it clear in that bill that it would only accept a successor to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who has been in a sense chosen by His Holiness. They would they would not accept a different Dalai Lama chosen in a sense by the Chinese. Now, both you and I know this is an extremely controversial topic and has been going on for a long time. Many uh, analysts believe that, in a sense, China is waiting for the day when the incumbent, His Holiness, is no longer there in his physical self, so to speak, so that, you know, the seat of the Dalai Lama can be, in a sense, usurped by the Chinese and a Chinese, uh, you know, pre-selected person placed on that seat so that all controls then come in their hand. Um, His Holiness has, of course, said that he will ensure that, you know, the right person is chosen and indeed that right person will probably be born in India. Talk to us a little bit about this issue. So basically, firstly, I would just like to clear the things with your audience. So I'm a research associate at the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives. My opinions here are basically mine. It has nothing to do with the foundation. So very interesting point like that you raised up, like on the issue of succession and reincarnation. I mean, this is something that His Holiness has made it very clear since 2011. We have the so-called Dharamsala Declaration where all things were laid clear when it comes to his succession. And there is going to be another huge declaration on his 90th birthday, on his international 90th birthday. I mean, technically, it was his 90th birthday in the Tibetan New Year this year. So next year, some things are going to happen. Definitely, things are going to unfold. But in this bill, like what you mentioned, I think this is something that even America has been following. This is something that was carried on from the 2020 Tibet Policy Support Act, where a whole section of the reincarnation thing was given very much there. And this promoting this current U.S. bill, which is called as promoting the promoting the dispute between Tibet-China Act, is going to further carry this forward. And definitely, like, one thing that is very much in the ears, in the eyes, in the noses, Everywhere, it's his succession. Like It's not only Tibetans, everybody is concerned. And definitely, we've seen what China has been doing. And one thing which uh, came to India, particularly in Dharamsala, visited his holiness, was what was China doing during that time, especially Xi Jinping? An interesting thing, I mean, our research intern, Rinzin Namge, he wrote a very nice article on it. I would recommend all your viewers to read that one. Like on the 18th of June, like you know that on the 18th, the US delegation arrived at Dharamsala. They met His Holiness on the 19th. But on the 18th of June, Xi Jinping visited a very particular temple in the Amdo region of Tibet. Amdo is basically where His Holiness was born. So they have this temple. It's very much aligned with the Yelupa sect of the Tibetan tradition of Buddhism, which His Holiness follows. So this temple, like Xi Jinping visited there, there were pictures of the previous pension lama. And you know the dynamics between the pension lama and Dalai Lama. 
So I think this gives a very clear signal to everybody. I, I'm a bit sad in the sense that many of our media missed this part, but this is the reaction that China is doing. They have planned everything meticulously. And we, from our side, we should also prepare ourselves for the things to come ahead. I think one of the big things that needs to be discussed in this context is, um, you know, there is there has been a, a broad agreement on what China is planning. You know, people know that this is the plan, and they're just waiting, in a sense, uh, for the absence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the incumbent Dalai Lama. Now, uh, America's overt support at this juncture, in clear terms, especially once the bill gets signed in absolutely written clear terms what does this do for the tibetan cause at this moment talk to us a little bit about that because america choosing to come up at this juncture uh, making a broad and a very well publicized declaration which is documented which will probably be signed by a president now you know what does this do it, it seems to have brought the tibetan cause once again to the limelight but also it seems to have underlined a red line. Do you think this is a red line that America has underlined that, you know, America will not support a Chinese selected Dalai Lama? Indeed, definitely. Like there has been precedent on this level when it comes to the pension Lama, like Chinese have appointed their own pension Lama and the world recognized pension Lama is currently incognito. We don't know about this very, about, very unfortunate situation. And the thing that is very interesting to me is like, I mean, all these things on reincarnation in particular have been previously mentioned in the 2020 Tibet Policy Support Act. But the capturing of the media of this very bill, which is in short called the Resolve Tibet Act, I think India played a very big role. Because last time the bill was there, the 2020 bill. But where was the media there? Where was the noise there? It was not that much. But right now, I think the role that India played, especially after the, uh, the US delegation, after they visited Dharamsala, CTA leadership, including His Holiness, they went to the New Delhi. Who did they meet? They meet the Ministry of External Affairs, Mr. Dr. Jay Shankar. They followed it up by meeting our own Prime Minister, PM Modi. So all this signaling gives a very big indication of what lies ahead when it comes to the whole Himalaya, with Tibet being the central focus of attention. And going deep into your question, like what does it mean for us Tibetans? For us Tibetans, it means very clearly that United States of America as a country, as a superpower supports us. And one thing that's very interestingly mentioned in this bill is how they would like to work with this bill and carry it forward as a multilateral process, like connecting with other countries, pushing other countries to follow a similar line. And I think something that we at the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives, did following the 2020 Tibet Policy Act, we came up with this document. It's called Resetting India's Tibet Policy. It was released in the in January of 2023. We very much followed what was mentioned there and improved upon it and put certain aspects that is very much Indian centric. So I think these are the things that we can work on in India in particular. Talk to me a little bit about the wider ramifications, you know, um, already the situation when the Taiwan, uh, you know, region is becoming hotter, so to speak. Very recently, there was the incident in the Philippines, the waters of the Philippines. Uh, you know, the Chinese are pushing in every direction and the situation in Taiwan seems to get more and more aggressive. The situation is getting more aggressive with, with the Philippines and, you know, in the entire South China Sea. Uh to, uh, you know, in a sense, do you think that the coming up and the underlining of the uh, of this new Tibet bill, in a sense, shows America's resilience or shows America's, uh, you know, that America shows that America will not back down in a sense that, you know, all these you know issues will not be buried in the face of Chinese aggression? Definitely, that is one of the major goals of these bills that have been passed, not only on Tibet, like they've even passed a bill on East Turkestan, the Uyghur Muslims, who are also like similar to Tibetans occupied by China currently. So all these signalings happen around a period during the 2020s, post-COVID. But you know what happened after post-COVID? We had these big, two major geopolitical ramifications that every that all our attention was captured to it. Firstly, the Ukraine war. Secondly, we had the Palestinian and 
Israel thing going on, the war going on. So all these things sort of diverted world's attention. But right now we can see that these things are gradually, you know, like with with time, they are also getting resolved in a amicable manner to a certain extent. And the focus is coming back to the Indo-Pacific and the larger Himalayas. Because even before 2020, if all of us know, like the Indo-Pacific was a really big thing. We had Quad. And rightly, as you mentioned, the South China Sea is where a lot of pivoting is going on. And recently, you know what happened. Like Taiwan has elected a new president and the to and fro that happens between Taiwan and India, like even though India does not formally recognize Taiwan or the Republic of China for that matter, the wishes when it comes to social media, like PM Modi congratulating, you know, accepting the congratulatory note by the president of Taiwan. That is a clear messaging here. I think social media and all these avenues of different different modes of diplomacy, I think I would put it in that way, is very crucial in our day of age, you know, especially to connect with audience. There was a time and period where you had to attend these big public rallies to send your message, to send your thoughts, to give a really strong statement. But right now, all these things can happen at a particular tweet message in social media where you have thousands and millions of people, you know, watching every step taken there. Talk to me a little bit about what at the moment, you're a young Tibetan, you know, you were impacted by China's takeover, um, aggressive takeover and usurping of, of Tibetan territories. Your family was directly impacted. For young Tibetans like you, what is your best case scenario and what is your worst case scenario? I guess your worst case scenario one knows, but what is your best case scenario? What do you hope will come out of all of this? I mean, the best case scenario obviously would be a free Tibet, a Tibet where we can return, where we can live at our ancestors' land. Uh, incidentally, my great parents, my grandparents, where they came from, was the Kailash region of Tibet. Like we call it Utsang. So it's a region which I aspire to go each day, like every day. Like in my home, it's very, uh, like I think I can talk to you about this. Like my father is very, I mean, he served at the Special Frontier Force, but there is this big image of Tibet where Mount Kailash is very much prominent. And what he did, I did not know when I was young, you know, like he put my small picture, like a passport picture on Mount Kailash. So I think it was his way of messaging that even though you're in India, like your home is there. So these sort of yearnings are very strong among every Tibetan, you know, like bearing the geopolitical situation, every, each one of Tibet, each and every individual of a Tibetan would aspire for a free Tibet. But in the geopolitical situation, we might have to navigate these Parts to different means, like currently exile, which is officially known as the Central Tibetan Administration of Middle Way Policy. So these sort of things must be, you know, it's a complex process. Like geopolitics is very complex, but the way that we navigate is something that we must take cognizance of all the facts, all the issues going around us. I understand that the best case scenario, Tenzing, is a free Tibet. But even His Holiness the Dalai Lama is on record having said that, you know, it's not independence that we seek, but autonomy. Now, I wonder in that framework of autonomy, you know, what kind of autonomy, what is the, you know, autonomy can make, mean many things. Uh, I want to uh, try and understand at the moment, you know, especially after the sort of coming of this Tibet bill, uh, especially if it, if it gets signed by a U.S. president, uh, what what framework of autonomy do you think will be acceptable to Tibetans? I think firstly, I think it's very much confirmed that the Resolve Tibet Act is going to be signed. Like when the US, when the leader of the US delegation that visited Dharamsala, uh, representative Michael McCall, like when he landed to the airport, there were media bustling, like asking him questions. And he, he just made it clear. He said, President Joe Biden is going to sign the bill. I think we can take word of it and basically confirm that a bill is going to be signed and made to an act. So going on to your question of what we, what sort of autonomy we see, I think it's very clear. It's laid down, like we had different, I think almost uh, nine or 10 rounds of dialogue with the Chinese in Beijing. Like the autonomy that we see is genuine autonomy. It's a concept where, you know, we, we put ourselves in the middle like there are two extremes. I mean, it's in some ways, it very much aligns with the Buddhist philosophy of Madhyamika, the middle way, Uma, we call it. So in one extreme, you have the uh, narration by China that Tibet is 
an inalienable part of China since history, since antiquity. I mean, that's what they are claiming it right now. That is one side of the extreme. And the other side, you have Tibet being independent free, which is the truth that we Tibetans aspire. And we may very much lay it on the table. But since this, these two extremes are there, we want to fall in the middle, which is called genuine autonomy and the middle way. That is the policy. And under this policy, what we see, as far as my knowledge, maybe I might be wrong at certain points here, but it's very clear that it will be a Tibet where Tibetans can practice, where Tibetans can self-determine determine their own aspiration. They can practice their religions freely. They can hold pictures of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, which is not being allowed. And funnily enough, even though they don't allow it, the Chinese want to recognize the succession. I mean, this is typical irony and, I mean, something that the current leadership of the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, has been saying time and again. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, you spoke about the talks, but those talks have been stalled for a long time, you know. Yeah. Um, do you think in some ways, uh, you know, after the after this Tibet bill, after China, you know, America's very clear and current, um, you know, pressure, talks could restart? Or do you think China could will take or could take now an even more belligerent position? I mean, that possibility is always there. Like China, I can, you know, step down on us and do things differently. Like it aspires to be a regional and eventually a world superpower. That is what its aim is. It has the China dream 2024, much like what we have, what we have in India, Vixit Bharat by 2047. So the difference and the main thing when it comes to what we aspire here is like, how do we navigate this path? Like as Tibetans, you know, and I think that is very crucial. And the dialogues that that have been happening at the end of the day we were able to communicate with the top brass leadership of China but some things did not fall into place and a major thing was the Chinese party wanted his holiness to recognize Tibet as being part of China number two they wanted to recognize Taiwan as being part of China how can his holiness a Buddhist monk and also a political leader at that matter say such thing he cannot go against history and another major point which I find is very much important in this bill is the recognition of the Tibetan territory. Tibet is not only the Tibet autonomous region, which many countries, I mean, even India for that extent, if you go along its 2003 policy and memorandum, it also recognized this people's, the Tibetan autonomous region as part of the People's Republic of China. I mean, they intentionally did it. There is some diplomatic space where India can work for its thing. But that is the major consensus and contentious issue when it comes to the dialogue and due to those reasons, like it has stopped. And another thing in this bill is like what China, what Beijing has been doing till now is they have been uh, meeting when it comes to these dialogues with the representative, with the special envoys of His Holiness. Like I met one of the special envoys, he had passed away, like Lodi Gary Rinpoche, very astute figure, the way that he thinks I mean, his book is amazing. I think if someone wants to know in detail about the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, it sh one should read his book. So the other important aspect when it comes here is how this whole issue became like certainly it blew up and no one could talk much about it. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned in this bill, it mentions clearly that the Chinese should not only have dialogue with the representatives of His Holiness, but also the political representative, which is the current Sikong and the Central Tibetan Administration, the dependent government in exile. This very much gives a space open saying that even if His Holiness, like there will be a period, like His Holiness says he'll leave till 113 years of age, 110. He constantly says this and all of us pray for that. But there will be, there will come a time when His Holiness will not be there. So this vacuum is being filled by this bill. That is very important. And it sends a clear message to China that it's not only His Holiness that you should talk with, should also talk with his political representative. For since 2011, His Holiness has political authority has been given. I think the other thing I wanted to ask you is I remember talking to a Tibet expert uh, a few months ago who said that, look, I mean, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, not, no matter what China says about him, 
is still somebody who takes a fairly moderate stance. And if at all, his stance has become more accommodating and moderate in the in recent years. He said that, well, you know, in a time, as you also say, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not there, younger generations of Tibetans, perhaps frustrated by such a long process that has not gone anywhere, are perhaps unlikely to be as accommodative or as, you know, moderate as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And therefore, you know, negotiations could be even tougher with the Chinese administration. Do you think that's a correct assessment as a young Tibetan yourself? I mean, I think that is in many ways a form of correct assessment that you brought to the table. And that's why I believe right now is the correct time for China to come to the negotiating table. Because if His Holiness is no more, who will be the voice to unite the Tibetans, both inside, I mean, occupied Tibet and outside like us? We are just a minority. We are the voice of our fellow Tibetan sisters and brothers in occupied Tibet. They will feel definitely, I mean, we would obviously feel frustrated, but they would definitely feel more frustrated. And what sort of tactic would they imply? Like there was a period when Tibetans inside Tibet to vent out their frustration, undergo this ultimate, I would call it the ultimate nonviolent protest of self immolation Till now, more than 150 plus Tibetans have self immolated This is an incredible, like an incredible number that unfortunately with passage of time, I mean, we humans have the tendency to forget all these things, but these things have been happening. And this very act of, ultimate protest sort of shows the frustration inside the Tibetans in occupied Tibet. You know, right now, I believe it is under the guidance, the vision, the leadership of His Holiness that everything is calm. Things might definitely change. That's why my main concern is Beijing. Like, I think they might be listening to this episode. Like, this is the correct time to come to the negotiating table, resolve the Tibet-China conflict. Otherwise, you never know what's going to happen in the future, you know. Things might take the, take a darker trajectory, which no one wants. You know, the vision of His Holiness is for Tibet to be a zone of peace, something that is very inspiring and inspirational. I mean, in many ways, it might go against the typical Machiavellian and pragmatic politics. It's beyond that. I think it's something that the world as a whole felt after the World War II, like we had UN coming up, but eventually, like I told you before, like human tendencies, we forget, forget. We tend to forget things and we just go back to our usual self. Tell me, Tenzing, the other thing to worth uh, thinking about clearly is that, you know, uh, China, the Tibet bill uh, that the US has presented also makes clear what kind of, you know, um, political establishments can be set up. I mean, there's talk that the US will not accept the Chinese, you know, um, consulate uh, in Tibet unless certain accommodations are made. And there's a whole bunch of sort of criteria that has been mentioned there. Uh, do you feel that, you know, the America also is trying to nudge uh, the Chinese into some sort of negotiated settlement? That, in a sense, in uh, His Holiness the Dalai, the Dalai Lama's lifetime could bring some sort of closure to this uh, this issue? Definitely. Like, that's what the Americans aspire like. I mean, there is their own national interest involved, definitely. We must not forget that. That is definitely there. But at the end of the road, like if Tibetans get what they aspire to currently, which is self-determination, which is also for a free Tibet, if that is aspired, like Tibetans would definitely work. You know, there was a period when America supported these Tibetan uh, freedom fighters, I would call it, like under the CIA. You know, we had these, uh, not only Khamba, the whole Tibetan region, they were part of this resistance army, which eventually dissipated after the U.S.-China rapprochement. But things are changing, you know. That's very interesting. You mentioned that things are changing. Um, in a sense, you're suggesting that, you know, in, the, in, a, in a sense, if nothing goes or nothing changes for the better now, one never knows in the absence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which way uh, a sort of different kind of more aggressive solution, search for a more aggressive solutions could be on the table. Definitely. It might be. Like, personally, in my opinion, I would not walk down that path because as a believer and as a follower of His Holiness, what his vision is, what his four principal commitments are, are laid out very clear. And I think many Tibetans would follow that path. But definitely, there might be others who might. Like, it's been almost like 60, 70 years. 
like Chinese have killed Tibetans. You know, that sense of uh, memory, it will not be forgotten easily. That's why, you know, that is the sense among Tibetans. Like, I remember, like, when I was at JNU, I had a neighbor, like, he was Chinese, you know. I'm someone who would like to talk, who would like to negotiate with them, who would like to, you know, just listen to uh, the other party's uh, thought, because that is what we humans are capable of. That is what separates us from animals, in my opinion, you know. But it was funny that some of my Tibetan friends said, like, you know, that he's a Chinese, so, you know, that is this sense among Tibetans. It's very there, it's very much there. But at the end of the day, through the visionary message and ideals of his holiness, he's laid down a path where both parties will win. So I think that's the most ideal and amicable solution, which at the end of the day would also benefit India, in my opinion. I also like, even though I'm a Tibetan, I'm a Tibetan who's born, born and brought up in India, I very much would like to see India prosper, you know. I very much align with these visions of making India Vixit Bharat very much. I think India has the potential to do a lot. As we come towards the end of our conversation, Tenzing, I have one or two last questions. One of my questions would be that, you know, today when you look at the whole Tibetan issue, uh, you know, as you said, President Biden is likely to sign the Tibet bill, the new Tibet bill very soon. Talk to us a little bit about the expectations Tibetans have if the regime changes in America uh, from uh, Democrat to Republican and President Trump comes back to power once again, uh, do you see the situation change then? I I think it won't change that much because Tibetans, the Tibetan support in America has been bipartisan. And that is what this delegation really brought to the table when it came to India. It was not the Republicans leading. It was not the Democratic leading. It was a bipartisan delegation. So that sends the message very clear. And incidentally, the 2020 Tibetan Policy Support Act was signed by the former president, who was a Republican, President Donald Trump. And currently, if President Joe Biden, not if, when President Joe Biden signs his bill, definitely say that both Republicans and Democrats have clear support to Tibet. And if you remember, like in 2006, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was honored the highest civilian U.S. award, the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal. Who, who was the president during the time? It was President Bush, a Republican, even though the Speaker of the House was Nancy Pelosi then. So support to Tibet in America is bipartisan. And that is what I find beautiful, not only in America, but also in India. You know, it's not the BGP, it's not the Congress, it's not the Aam Aadmi Party. Everybody supports Tibet. Because the cause of Tibet is something that is not political. I mean, it is political, but at the end of the day, it's about truth, it's about justice. And this is what every human beings at the end of the day aspire for. And that's what I think it resonates very strongly with everybody crosses party lines and everything. My last question then, Tenzing, uh, something you said a little earlier in the conversation and something I think His Holiness the Dalai Lama said that, you know, China wanted to wipe out even the image of me, even, even putting a little photograph of me was a crime in China uh, and wipe out every memory of my very image. But what happened, uh, you know, many more people today follow me and listen to me and uh, hear my words and hear my messages and believe in those messages than China would have ever wanted. You know, the, exactly the opposite happened. Now, we are also sitting at a time when China is embracing especially its old indigenous faiths, you know, um, Taoism, uh, you know, Buddhism, you know, all the original indigenous faiths of China, the Communist Party seems to be trying to embrace in a sense so that, you know, it can more cohesively build the nation, the Chinese nation at a time of great turmoil. Um, therefore, Buddhism is really growing in China uh, in, in many ways. And therefore, the words of the Dalai Lama are also growing. Uh, how do you see that this growth of religion, you know, the Chinese Communist Party and Mao and others for a long time wanted to wipe out all religion from China. You know, that hasn't happened. And now there's a sort of a revival under the Communist Party. How do you see that play out in the Tibetan cause? I think the revival by the Chinese Communist Party is a political revival in the sense that, like, even when they revive these religions, they put the Chinese characteristic, Xi Jinping's thought, all these things are very much evident. Even when President Xi Jinping visited the 
Tibetan monastery in Amto, the region where his holiness was born. That was the main sort of uh, theme of his talk when he engaged with the uh, monks there. So all these things are very much evident. And China itself is changing. The People's Republic of China is changing. It was formed in 1949. Sometimes we also tend to forget it. It's, it's a new nation. It is changing. And with access to internet, social media, like people, even though like the great red, what do you call it? The internet barrier of China, is, I mean, it's very strong. The very red wall. Like, like they can, yeah, they conduct all these uh, gray zone warfare through all these tactics. But... The other thing is a lot of information is percolating inside China, especially among the youths. If you're in Twitter, you could see a lot of things happening. And today itself, I was listening to this uh, podcast by an Indian professor at JNU. She made it very clear, like how in China, yoga is being practiced. You know, Just imagine that. Buddhism and all these things are something that China already has. But concepts like yoga, which have not been part of Chinese culture, are coming inside China. So this shows that China can change. Who can change China? The people, you know. And us Tibetans, at the end of the day, we are very much against the government, its policies. But the people, at the end of the day, are the ones who matter. And we manage to align with them, their solidarity. It's been wonderful talking to you, Tenzing. Thanks for your time uh, and for talking us through this very important moment in the Tibetan cause. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.